A reading from the Epistle to the Hebrews, the 11th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children, because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, as he, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them waiting, watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. He will have them recline at table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, 
Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and the wise manager, whom the master put in charge of his servants to give them food, their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing him when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming, and he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The good news I want to proclaim this morning is that God is pleased to give us his kingdom, to do in us, in us and through us, so much more than we as humans could ever do for ourselves. Those of you who joined us for worship last week will recall that we looked at the parable of the rich fool from earlier in chapter 12 of Luke. I've reprinted it in your bulletin insert uh, below the announcements for those of you who need a refresher or who, who aren't familiar. That parable is about a rich man whose fields yielded a bumper crop and he had to decide what to do with the surplus. But rather than consulting with anybody else or thinking of anyone around him who might be in greater need of those that grain, this man decided to tear down his barns and build bigger ones, to store all the grain in these new barns in order to reassure himself that he is now even more secure than he was before. However, this plan proved to be quite foolish when that very night the man's life was demanded of him rendering all the earthly things he'd stored up for himself to be of no benefit to him. So last Sunday, we talked about how the point of this parable was, was relevant to us. As like the rich fool, we can also be prone to being dominated by greed, whether because we've come to believe that it's solely up to us to secure ourselves financially and that belief informs decisions we make, or because we believe the lie of materialism, that the more we have materially, the better our lives will be. We're all vulnerable to either of those lies and often believe them both. But after service last Sunday at fellowship hour in the parish hall, some of us began to discuss the challenge of applying passages like that parable of the rich fool in our day in 2022. It's not that it's irrelevant, not at all, but just because of how different the world is now than when Jesus walked the earth and taught in this way and used these examples. Of course, human sinfulness is the same, which is why it remains completely relevant. But for the rich fool the first century, life was a bit simpler than it is for any of us in 2022. For example, there was, of course, in the first century, no commodities market 
for him to consider as he thought about what to do with his grain. There was not even a way to transport his grain beyond the immediate area where he lived. So when debating what to do with his bumper crop, his options were pretty much limited to two, to either building bigger barns and keeping it for himself like he did, or sharing it with the poor who lived immediately around him, you know, within a few miles, being rich toward God and trusting God would continue to provide for him in future years. But since that time, in the past 2,000 years, human advances in transportation and irrigation, machinery, the emergence of the commodities market, and pesticides, all of this have changed the agricultural industry dramatically, as we all know, living around it. So the way the world of agriculture has changed, the way it's changed since Jesus' day, can make the dilemma of the rich fool seem a bit alien, even oversimplistic, making it lose a bit of its punch, let's say, for a farmer. But not just for a farmer, for us as well. Since the industry of wealth management, so-called wealth management, has also changed dramatically since Jesus' day of walking the earth. For example, if we happen to come into some more money or just live with a, are blessed to live with a financial surplus, there are a myriad of additional options for what we could do with it compared to what that rich fool had at his disposal. Right? Modern banking provides us with savings accounts, with college funds, with pensions. While there are also a lot more ways that we could help others and be generous with what we have, right? We could make a donation right now to help a famine in a different continent, right? And then there's watchdog organizations to try to ensure that that money would actually get to those people who need it, right? So suffice it to say, all of this can make it more complicated to discern how God is calling us to implement or apply the principles of some of Jesus' parables like this one from last week. It's not that it makes it irrelevant, not at all, right? These issues of greed are still very basically challenges we deal with in our hearts. But how that should impact what we do with this dollar or that can require discernment for sure. It's not as cut and dry as it might have been for the rich fool. Moreover, the ways the world has changed since the first century can also just cause some of the parables like this to lose their punch, right? For example, since Jesus' day, human ingenuity has led to further means for us to protect ourselves against material loss, such as the creation of community fire departments. Just think about how much the creation of fire departments and fire trucks has changed the world, right? And the risk that we have in relation to fire. And then you combine with that mutual insurance policies that protect us against loss. In fact, insurance policies as we know them today actually came about after the Great Fire of London in 1666. This impacts how we hear some of Jesus' teachings, for example. So when we hear in today's reading from verse 39, Luke's passage, we hear Jesus use the analogy of a thief breaking in. It doesn't, it may have some punch, but it doesn't have the same punch for us as it would have for folks in the first century, right? In his day, if somebody broke in and took your valuables, they were just gone, right? You were just up a creek, right? That act alone of a thief breaking in could ruin somebody if they're storing everything in one place. For us today, the fear of someone stealing something of ours that's valuable has in many ways been reduced to a fear of having to pay our deductible to replace it. It's true, right? Ain't that right, Peter? Peter? <laughs> All 
right? It's, it, it has become generally more of an inconvenience or a little setback, right? It costs something, but complete ruin has in a lot of ways been taken off the table. Well, as wonderful as some of these human advances have been, and they truly have been, right? I mean, whether we're talking about insurance or fire trucks or modern banking, we haven't even talked about advances in medicine and technology. As wonderful as they've been, a consequence of all these sorts of human advances is they have given humans the false sense that we don't really need God. They've given many of us a false sense and kind of given society at large, for sure, a false sense that we don't really need God. Scholar Andrew Root explains this in a book of his I've been working through. Before all of these advances, humans had a keen sense of their helplessness and vulnerability against the elements and the changes of this world, right? And thus, they had a keen sense of their need for God's help not to be loving people, but even just to survive. Did you know that in the Middle Ages, around, like around the 11th century, 1,000 years ago, the church had this problem with people sneaking out the host from Holy Communion. Instead of swallowing it, right, they'd put it in their mouths and then kind of discreetly spit it back out into their hand and, and stash it somewhere to sneak it out in many instances so they could give it to their sick animal for healing or so they could bury it in their field in hopes of ensuring a good harvest. Think about that. People's sense of vulnerability and the belief that God was their provider that their physical sustenance and survival depended upon him was so much greater because there was no medicine for their sick cow and there was no irrigation to make up if there wasn't rainfall or pesticides for their crops. And so as a consequence, there was quite literally no such thing as an atheist in this world until about 300 years ago, right? It was just unthinkable, right? I mean, you needed God to, make, to, to be able to eat next week. You know what I mean? There was no such thing as an atheist until about 300 years ago. But at risk of oversimplifying, the human advances that have mitigated some of our physical vulnerability, and just some, right? I mean, let's be clear, just a little bit of it. It's not like disease or catastrophic loss has actually been eradicated. It's not like biological death has been solved, right? We are all going to die, right? I know there's a few guys in Silicon Valley or something that think they're going to figure that one out, but... Not to mention that nothing has been done to eliminate evil or to make us humans less sinful, right? So even though we could eliminate homelessness tomorrow in this country, like, we don't do it, right? Why? Because of our hard hearts as a people, corporately. In the big picture and in light of all the problems we face, the advances of human ingenuity are actually quite small. But those, de- those developments have coupled with some other factors to give people the sense, the illusion, that God is not really needed. And along with that, the standard for living the good life has really been reduced to living to old age and having enough for our physical needs to be met, right? That's kind of the dream, right? That's kind of the American dream, right? You get to live to old age, to retirement, and don't have to worry where your next meal's coming from. That's it. And yet, like Jesus said to us last week, Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Or like we translated that, true life, the true life my Father has for you is not found in the surplus of possessions. There is more to life than that if we have eyes to see it. Elsewhere, he says what? Man does not live by bread alone, 
In other words, true life is not found in merely biologically surviving, but in the life of his kingdom. So where our Luke passage picks up today, Jesus has been, had been exhorting his disciples not to be so concerned about what they will eat or drink or wear. He had said to them in verse 32, do, or he says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom, to give you his kingdom. The good news is that God is pleased to give us his kingdom doing in us and through us so much more than humans could ever do ourselves, far beyond the capacities of our ingenuity. And so we mustn't let things that humankind has achieved, which again are actually quite limited in the grand scheme of things, distract us from the good news that God wants to lead us into a life that can frankly only be received from him by faith, not by ingenuity. We can trace this truth all the way back to the life of Abraham, who was the subject of our first and second lessons today, as Karen read. I won't get too deep into the weeds on it, but for those of you who don't know the story, Abram was a guy who was frankly doing just fine, as far as we can tell from a worldly perspective, right? He was doing just fine hanging out in Ur, living his life, when the Lord, whom he didn't know at all, came to him and said he wanted to be Abram's God and bless the whole world through him. And yes, bless the whole world in ways that the world couldn't do for itself. And so as our passage from Hebrews today recounts, Abraham decided to trust God's promise and follow the Lord, live by faith. Verse 10 of Hebrews says, For Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. So rather than trusting in human advancement and some metaphorical tower of Babel, he was waiting on the kingdom God would establish. And that city is the kingdom of God that has come near to us now in Christ through Abraham's line, as Jesus was. Jesus made a relationship with God available to all of us and invited us to let him shepherd us into the life of the kingdom, of living no longer for ourselves, but in sacrificial love toward God and our neighbor. And that is true living. And transformation to this sort of living, this kingdom life, can only be received through learning to trust God and following his lead not through human ingenuity. And so the very good news is that God is pleased to give us his kingdom, doing in us and through us much more than humans could ever do ourselves. But of course, this is easier said than done, right? I can repeat it over and over up here, as you've probably gotten used to me doing, I expect. I can repeat this good news up here but it's so much easier to repeat it, to say it, to talk about the wonderful promises of God's kingdom than to actually receive them because of our sin. Our sinfulness causes us to not only be resistant to change and the discomfort that comes with change, it keeps us from always believing that God's kingdom way really is better than a path we might chart for ourselves. Keeps us from trusting that he will really take care of us and that we don't need to always be looking out for ourselves. And this is why Jesus says what he does as our Luke reading continues at verse 35. I've highlighted in green Verse 35, Jesus tells his disciples, be ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he, the master, God, will dress himself to serve them, will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. 
So here Jesus' exhortation is that for us to make and continue to make living for him the goal of our daily lives. That's what he's inviting us to do, to not fall asleep spiritually, to continue to make the goal of our daily lives living for him, even though we can't see him like that master who's gone away. So it requires living by faith. That's the decision he's trying to call us into day after day. Because then in verse 39, which I've highlighted in red, which I didn't mean to make that look quite so ominous, but maybe, it, maybe that was the Holy Spirit choosing that color. <laughs> he warns us in 39 to guard against that temptation that's now always lurking for all of us, which is to live for ourselves, right? Right? Here he actually changes his metaphors. It can be easy to think we're kind of talking about the same little parable or metaphor here, but he changes it. He's he's now speaking about an owner of a house saying, if the owner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. So the call of faith is to live like a servant of God rather than living like owners of our own domain builders of our own little kingdoms. And yet today, the temptation to do that, to go our own way, to live self-sufficiently, to live for ourselves, ignoring others, is stronger than it has ever been. Because we live in a world that no longer believes in a God who's intimately concerned with how we conduct our affairs, right? We live in a society that that puts forth this false sense that humans can do anything. Just because, hey, look at what we've done. Look at our skyscrapers and our scientific advances, right? That we can therefore do anything, that any problem can always be figured out. And that dulls our sense of our awareness of our need for God, right? Again, it's not that that stuff's bad. It's that it dulls our sense that we need God at all. It blinds us to looking for the kingdom that he wants us to lead into. And we also finally live in a world that has more distractions than ever before, right? As scholar Alan Noble notes, and I've quoted this here before, he says, Innumerable gadgets, websites, channels, streaming services, songs, films, and biometric wristbands all constantly vie for our attention throughout the day. Constantly. Beeps and buzzes and vibration, whatever. Even if you're not much of a techie, society still will provide you with no shortage of ways to distract yourself with television and radio to keep on throughout the day, to not get too deep into our thoughts or not get too introspective, right? Keep the focus out there on how it's hitting the fan out there. So perhaps the greatest challenge I'm highlighting for us today, the greatest challenge for us as individual believers is just to stay awake to God at all in our daily lives. So much about our worlds is geared towards spiritually lulling us to sleep. Do any of you feel that? You might go through your day and you kind of get, oh yeah, I forgot about God. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe that's just me. Should I say that as a priest? Yeah, I mean, it's real, right? Wake up, got all these things to do. In fact, the primary purpose of any spiritual disciplines we may do is, first of all, to remind us, to wake us up to the reality that this is our Father's world that we're living in, not mankind's world. I believe this is first and foremost why attending church regularly can be so valuable, right? It's meant to wake us up to the Lord and wake us up to other people, right? Instead of just living in our little individualistic world with our our personal concerns. It's meant to wake us up to other people whom he may give us an opportunity to love or who he he might want to bless us through. His spirit's in them and one another here as we gather, 
Right? That's why as, as much of a blessing as the Zoom and live stream thing is, it is no replacement for gathering here together. Right? In fact, it sends that message of, I'm looking at a screen, right? This is the same as if I was watching 60 Minutes. Right? Subconsciously, it's just content to be consumed instead of an encounter with the living God, an encounter with his spirit and one another. So as much as that's a blessing, avail yourself of it when you need it, but don't pretend it's the same, right? God's waiting to lead us each and every day. If we can put down the screens and and cease the endless, I'm not saying put them down all the time, make space, for him and cease that endless striving of maintaining our own little kingdoms that we're prone to build for ourselves. Long enough for him to have a chance to lead us into what he might have for us in that day. So that's the challenge I think for us to think about uh, this morning as individuals, this good news that God is pleased to give us his kingdom and do in us and through us much more than we humans could ever do ourselves. But I think there's also a call for us as a community, as a parish, to our leadership, to me and our vestry, to stay awake to what God wants to do here. You know, we went, as a parish, we we went 10, well, yeah, 10 years approximately with this building thing hanging over us, not knowing what was going to happen, blah, 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 blah. And praise the Lord, right, for how he moved. But what about now, right? I mean, it's just a building, right? What are we going to do? More particularly, what is he calling us to do, right? We don't have to figure it out. But are we opening, are we open to his leading us as a parish into how we could build and expand the kingdom in Oakdale and beyond? Where are we putting our money? Where are we putting our energy? Where are we putting our time? Is it to build sort of a worldly kingdom for ourselves with a cross on the roof or a heavenly one where people can come and find living water and spiritual shelter from a world that is not bent toward their flourish? So as we move forward in our liturgy here in a moment, in a, in a little while, our offertory hymn, It's going to be a means for us, hopefully, to pray as a group for this parish in song that we might remain expectant that God wants to do things in and through us as a parish so much more than we could ask or imagine so long as we stay awake following his lead. I'll go ahead and invite Annette up because in a few moments we'll join in singing our response hymn, which will focus on us as individuals further reminding our hearts of the true life that is found in staying awake to God, that we might organize our lives accordingly. So let's stand and respond to the good news that God is pleased to give us his kingdom, doing in us and through us so much more than humans could ever do ourselves.